uh, two uh, numbers in it. One is the strength of a little bar magnet, M, and one is the distance, uh, radial distance vector of, uh, of how far away you are. And with these two numbers, you can work out the magnetic field anywhere. You can draw pictures like this uh, using these um, differential equations. Uh, it's pretty simple. All you need to know then in this case is the value of the bar magnet, the moment of the bar magnet. Um, but of course, the Earth's field is not just a simple bar magnet. Um, it's more complicated, so this is the full equation for the internal field. We have these little coefficients, little g and little h, um, and which make a, a list of numbers, which if you have those numbers, um, you can really predict the magnetic field anywhere outside the core. Um, and so having that list of numbers, you can then uh, render the field and visualize it in many different ways. Here's just three examples. One is this hairy eyeball, I call it, um, of the earth. This is the core. And the magnetic lines of flux come out. You can see it does look somewhat like that farm action picture, but it's more complicated. There are regions of more flux, regions of less flux. And this can also be represented, for example, in the radial strength of the radial magnetic field coming out of the core. Um, this is at the core mantle boundary. You can see it doesn't look anything like a bar magnet, in which case um, this would uh, be the blue along the waist here and uh, red at the poles. Um, but as you go away from the center of the Earth, it becomes more and more dipolar. So this is the field uh, at the surface, the strength of the field at the surface of the Earth in 2005. It's uh, similar to today. Um, and um, and uh, so you can see it does look somewhat dipolar where you have a belt of lower field values at the equator and higher field values at the pole. But it's anything, it's not, of course, perfect dipole. It's not just little m, which makes it more interesting. And so um, if we look at the, uh, so this is a, a little animation of the field. We have these, these tables of numbers that go back to 1900. And from those tables of numbers, you can make this picture. Um, and starting at 1900, you can see that over the last 100 years, the field has changed a lot. Um, this low belt, the South Atlantic anomaly, is growing. Um, here it's starting again. These um, red zones are, are becoming uh, less pronounced. And as the North Pole, the ploid from the surface of the Earth where the field is vertical, goes from here up to the pole, uh, and here, the South Pole goes uh, more further north. You can see it's really quite variable. The overall strength of the field has been dropping uh, over the last 100 years by about 8%. So this is the strength of the first term, which is equivalent to that little m in the first picture. So the field is um, constantly changing and um, endlessly fascinating. So before 150 years ago, we had no direct measurements of field strength. And so we have to go to indirect methods, which um, is the paleomagnetist like a guy runs bread and butter. So we can get full vector measurements from geological and archaeological materials, if we're lucky. Um, and I'm going to talk mostly, uh, I'm going to talk today about the archaeological um, materials that Kagai uh, and I started using. So, um, and I'm going to focus on in particular strength measurements that were done in uh, in the Levant and also elsewhere. <coughs> so, how is how are the measurements done? Um, pots when they uh, get fired. They're fired extremely hot. That's what makes them strong. Um, and when things are this hot, they are not magnetic. They, the spontaneous magnetization is, uh, um, disappears above something called the Curie temperature. 
And then when they cool, certain minerals in the pots um, uh, become magnetic, and but the energy is so high that there's no fixed sensitization <coughs> in, in the material, and they are in equilibrium with the Earth's magnetic field, which is important because then when when they cool down to room temperature, um, the magnetization is fixed and it retains a record of the Earth's magnetic field. So here's a little movie. Um, of this process done by my niece when she was in high school. <laughs> she's very famous in paleobatic circles, although she's an entomologist. <laughs> so um, she, these are, are magnetic crystals, so at high temperature, I'll run this again, um, there is no magnetization in these crystals, and then at a certain temperature, the magnetization turns on, but there's some high energy, so they, the moments are not fixed. There's an equilibrium magnetization, um, and, um, and then as it cools down, the rate at which the flips occur becomes slower and slower until at room temperature, hopefully some of them are will not flip for billions of years, so we can actually study the magnetic field through the history of the Earth. And um, so the idea is that because the field is in equilibrium with the external field, the first approximation is that it's the magnetization of the object, which is cool, is proportional to the magnetic field, and this is true for low fields like the Earth's. Um, uh, except for it starts to bend over at high earth field uh, uh, strengths. And um, so that you can measure the magnetization in the laboratory. And if you know the slope of this line, then you can work out the ancient magnetic field. So what you do, I mean, in the simplest case, is you measure the magnetization, the natural remnants it's called, um, and then um, you cook it in the lab and cool it in a known field, this lab field, and measure the magnetization induced so you get the slope of this line and then you can work out on the lab field and this ratio you can work out ancient field. Okay, so easy peasy was a big fuss. Of course, the function is not exactly linear. The uh, specimens may change their capacity to acquire magnetization as you keep them in the laboratory. Um, and uh, in, they may have been acquired at, under different conditions. For example, if the original acquiring cool over weeks or days or overnight, that's slower than in the laboratory, in our laboratory, where it cools over less than an hour. And that changes the slope of the line. So um, that needs to be accounted for. Also, the magnetization may not be, uh, those little crystals may not be uniformly um, directed. They may be anisotropic, so that the magnetization is a function of direction in the field, not just field strength. And so that needs to be taken into account. And also, something might have happened, for example, with pots or something. They may have been reheated, used in the kitchen, something like that, in which case, oops, um, you know, you've messed up your magnetization. So all these things need to be accounted for, and it makes the, um, the job of trying to figure out the magnetization of the, the ancient field um, endlessly exciting and subject to lots of arguments, of course. So we have a very complicated experiment now, um, and I'm not going to go into this. Basically, we check for all of those problems that I mentioned, and some others, um, and uh, we've come up with an estimate for the magnetic field. So experiments like this have been done uh, since the 30s, um, and, uh, and they've been done in the Levant since the 60s. And um, so when Haggai, started, Haggai and I started this business, uh, this was the state of the data from the Levant. Um, and, uh, and Egypt, uh, you know, this general area. Um, and uh, this is a figure from our 2004 BSF proposal, our first one, 
Uh, and you can see these are the data uh, from uh, from the literature. Uh, they're a mess. The squares were data from Egypt done by not firing. It was a really silly technique. Um, and it's not used anymore. Um, but the red dots are uh, done in the manner that I just described, or similar to it, it's a simpler form of the experiment. And um, the, uh, this dashed line is the present little M that I showed you in the beginning. And uh, we looked at these data, and, and this purple line was the best field model. So people have been doing this experiment for quite a while. There's global data. So uh, Monica Corta and uh, Kathy Constable um, put, made the, um, those, those tables the G, with, with all the Gs and Hs. They go back 150 years. Um, they extended it out 7,000 years, which is a very brave thing to do. And this is the prediction from their model at the time of this proposal. And you can see it just kind of scoots along the present field um, because it's confused by all these blue squares. And um, then um, Anish Benjamin was working um, uh, actually with Kathy and Monica Corta um, uh, in, and uh, started working with her uh, advisor, Yves Gallet, in France to, in Syria. To, and they came up with this initial curve in 2003. So they favor this kind of high field model. Um, uh, and so these are the data, these are the most recent data when we wrote this proposal. Um, the model, of course, does not capture this high field behavior. And so in our proposal, we said, well, is the field straight or is there, is there really this variability which is not captured in the models? Is this real? Um, and so here's the first hint that maybe there was a high field around 3,000 years ago here in this area. Um, and uh, so obviously looking at this, these data, we thought, well, we need to have material that has better age control, and we need better intensity estimates, and we need to sort out, you know, is the field high here or not? Um, and so we were thinking, struggling, thinking, well, how can we do this experiment better? So, um, uh, we wanted something that would behave well during our experiment, something that could be accurately dated, and uh, material that archaeologists would let us have. So, um, in several discussions at meetings, we thought, uh, a guy said to me, I've been talking about quench materials for quite a while um, in the literature, and he said, well, do you suppose copper mining slag would work? It's a quench material. <coughs> and I've been looking in Cyprus and seeing all the um, uh, piles of slag, and I had a similar thought at the time. And so I looked at it and I said, gee, you're a genius. Well, let's do it. And so we decided to go after copper mining slag. Why slag? All oh, the beauties of slag. It's a wondrous substance. <laughs> Because there's a lot of it. This is this pile I saw in um, uh, Cyprus. It's 30 meters tall of just, this is Roman era stuff. And it just, you know, the Romans, they're just nuts. So they built this pile of, of <coughs> slag. And uh, the slag, it looks like kind of a lava flow. And the lovely thing about it is that it's got um, charcoals embedded in it, which are the are the wood that is used to make the make to fire the ovens that melt the slag. So we have no ambiguity about the association of the charcoal with the material that we're dating. So we can get an accurate or a precise, let's say, age estimate without the wood effect and all the other things that play archaeologists in coming up with the chronology. We just date it. Um, and uh, and Archaeologists really don't care about this stuff. It's dirty, it's ugly, nobody puts it in a 
very few people put in a museum, but you can see the museum in China once. But, um, uh, and it contains a record of ancient technology, which is interesting because that means that archaeologists are interested in collecting this stuff, analyzing it, um, and studying it. And so there were a number of uh, samples around that archaeologists were just more than happy to let us have. <laughs> and that's a, a requirement for this thing. So, and so um, a collaboration, Tom Levy was um, a co-investigator on our first grant, the 2004 BSF, and our friend Haggai Ron, this, uh, I think I only took two pictures of him ever, and this is one of them. Uh, I just don't take pictures of people, I guess. Um, and uh, so Tom Levy is a professor at, the, at uh, UC San Diego in our archaeology, our, our anthropology department. And uh, you guys know this man and his two students, um, Eris Ben Yosef, who's here today. Here you are. Hello, Eris. And um, who was going to do a PhD student with this man. Um, and Ron Shar, who did his PhD, he's you know him. Uh, he um, was uh, a guy's uh, student at the time, and, um, and these two fellows um, ended up, after their PhDs, being postdocs in my laboratory, working on this project. And we're still doing it today. So, the first, um, first results uh, were published by uh, Ben Yosef et al. in 2008. And you can see I took away all that other noise and just focused on comparing our results with the Syrian results of our French colleagues, um, Yves Galet and, um, and Agnes Genevieve. And those are the blue squares here. The red dots are uh, Eris's. Um, and this, remember that width of the high values in 3,000 years ago that were not in the model? Um, that's one, one um, result that we got. Uh, this was from Jordan. And this, this is the present field, 80 ZAM squared. squared. And uh, later, we, uh, we defined a geomagnetic spike as being twice as high as the present field. So this was our first whiff of a spike. Um, which mimics the, and you can see it's way higher even than the Syrian data that were, uh, were puzzling us already. And this is the model, the current model at the time, which is starting to um, see this high value, but uh, because the uh, Egyptian data were thrown out. Um, and so the model is now becoming higher, but nowhere near as high as this data point. Which we got, but of course it's you know it's just one data point. I don't know you don't want to make a big deal out of it. Of course we did, but uh, maybe we shouldn't have. <laughs> um, anyway, it caught our attention, and um, we um, wrote a second um, Binational Science Foundation proposal in 2008, and the stated goals in that proposal were to figure out how high can the field get. Uh, so we wanted to replicate this spike in nearby locations and using different materials if possible. And uh, an issue is how fast can the field change? Um, because if you look at this, if you just decide that the French data are correct, which I believe they are, um, and our data are correct, which I also believe they are, uh, then this implies extremely rapid rise and decay of the field, which made everybody uncomfortable. So the question was, how fast can the field change? We needed higher resolution records. And um, with dates associated with them. And then, um, and then the question is, because it was clear then that this high was not observed in Greece or Bulgaria or some of the other places that had beautiful records, um, uh, that it's, it, is this global? Is this a global feature? In which case, the entire body of Bulgarian and Greek data are wrong, which nobody likes that answer. 
um, particularly not the people working in Greece and Bulgaria, um, and, um, or, or even Syria. Um, and so we wanted to look globally, more globally. And so this proposal, because it's by a National Science Foundation, I pointed out that America also has stuff to look at. So I, we put in that we wanted to look at Hawaii and um, the Pacific Northwest um, to look for evidence of these high field values and their agents and whether, whether this was a global feature or not. And so, um, since the, the first place we started was because this spike was found in a slag mound in Jordan, um, we went back to Jordan, and because Tom Levy um, is, was, had a whole expedition set up to, to work in Jordan, uh, it was very convenient to go there and sample the same age material again. And uh, this, uh, this project was a lot of what Eris ben thesis was about, um, not the paleomagnetism, the archaeology of it, but, uh, but, but we got a lot of stuff out of that pile. So uh, here's the, the, our first object of design was um, this pit, which Eris and, and his friends dug. Um, and uh, I, I think it was actually a bunch of undergrads probably drug it with, uh, with the, the papa standing around. <coughs> a little barrel over there. And, um, and so we had this, this uh, eight meter pile of slag which had been um, dated with radio carbons. So here's a, a drawing of that excavation. Um, this is this wall that I just showed you. These red circles are uh, radio carbon dates. They range from uh, 970 BCE to 1100 something BCE, so encompassing this period, in very interesting period of time, with the very high field values, about 1000 BCE. The blue, um, no, the green uh, letters here are um, the samples that we did our experiments on, and here's some examples. And um, all of these are very high values. This one uh, is especially high with a value of 200 zeta ammeter squared, which is way higher than the 160 spike value. And uh, so we got really excited about this. Um, and uh, the data implied very high fields. Um, they implied very rapid changes in the field. Um, you can see in this one pile, these data down here, uh, it's uh, 80 microtesla, which is about um, 160, give or take, uh, zeta ampere squared. This is 110, uh, this is 60. So it went from high to extremely high to not so high, all in this eight meter pile, which is just a few hundred years. So um, we thought, oh wow, the field really can change rapidly and get to extremely high values. And I want to put this in context because there, there are almost no data in the database with field values this strong for the entire history of the Earth. So this was an eye-popping uh, number and um, and so, of course, very serious people doubted that this could be true. And they wrote papers about, you know, what idiots have got to wear in our students. It's very embarrassing. So, um, not to be deterred, um, we continued, we persisted, um, and we used different recording media, more ceramics, which is a more traditional material for archaeomagnetism. We expanded the age range and we sought materials that had even better age control um, and, um, and, and expanded the geographic coverage. And so uh, our next target was um, to move down the street from Jordan to Timna, your own national park. Um, and which is full of slag. It's really lovely. The National Park devoted entirely to slag. Uh, and here's this little pile that was left. Um, it's a couple meters. 
Um, and uh, this is the cooperative work of Ron Shire. Shire is the first author, and Ben Yosef was uh, the archaeologist in charge of this excavation. And, um, and Haggai and I helped where we could. I played Wheelbarrow Girl, and, and, uh, um, and so we, we uh, investigated this pile and took these samples and dated it. It's, the dates here are really extraordinary because um, Eris found little date seeds in the pile that were the dates that were being eaten by the people who were smelting. So there is no ambiguity about that age, and it turned out to be a very good age. So this is exceptionally well dated, and um, and the data, after lots of work, Ron came up with this um, this picture. All of these data are far higher than anything observed in Syria in that picture before, um, which topped out at about 120. So these, these red ones are from Timna. The green ones are uh, from, um, from uh, Hirbet and Nahas, the, that, that uh, pit I showed you. And the, uh, open, the uh, triangles are pottery, and, um, or these diamonds are pottery. And so um, you can see where we had pottery and um, and flag in the same place, we got the same answer, so we were trying to address this problem. And this, of course, implied extremely rapid field changes, and all of these data are higher than just about anything in the database ever before. So we thought, hey, we nailed it. We've got the same behavior in two different sections, and different materials, and good dates and everything, so please shut up, everybody. It's real. And of course, they didn't shut up. So. Uh, we, we kept working on it, and um, in uh, several different studies, and I'm fast forwarding because I'm running out of time. Um, in a series of publications, uh, Shara Dal 2015, uh, dealing with our Cyprus project, which was a lot of fun. Um, Tom Leedy and, and I, and uh, Ron Shara, and Paris and Yosef, and my son, and his girlfriend, and a bunch of other people went to Cyprus to dig that pile, that lovely 30 meter pile that I showed you earlier, and some others, and uh, worked very hard. Um, and those data are these data, and some here. And then Ron Shar um, started working on the Tel Megiddo and Tel Hatsor uh, sections, and that's these green, these things coming up here. And then um, Eris uh, got hold of some um, storage jars, Judean storage jars that had the, the name of the guy who owned them stamped right on them. And so some of these are dated to within uh, a decade or better. Um, and so that's these data here. And so now, um, and that came out recently, Ben Yosef et al. Uh, 2017. Um, and, and there's also some data from um, no, this doesn't have the Jordan. Okay, so uh, so this is the state of the Levantine archaeomagnetic curve, which is uh, Ron's term for this project. Um, the green dots are our uh, data in either either the Huji lab or the SIO lab. Both of those labs have been intercalibrated, so they're essentially uh, the same uh, same procedures and same. Um, um, accuracy so that we can share uh, data amongst ourselves. And then there's the blue squares, which are our French friends and now some also Dutch uh, friends have been working on. And so these um, blue squares are the basically the Syrian data and a couple of data points from Iraq and from Turkey thrown in. Um, and, um, and you can see where we have data in the same age periods. These agree with each other very well, um, but still in Syria, um, you don't see these spikes. And now, you'll notice that there's two of them. These are the data from uh, that have survived uh, Ranshar's severe cutting. Uh, he uh, has uh, tightened up our selection criteria um, and some data points, like that 200 zeta 8 meter square one disappeared because it, it didn't match our current criteria. But we believe that um, if if the stricter you are 
the more confidence you can have in the result. And you can see that now there's actually quite a lot of, of agreement amongst the different data sets. And now there's not just this one 1,000 BCE spike, but there's two. And this one is at 701,000 BCE, which is extremely accurately dated because of the Assyrian uh, disaster known as Armageddon happened right there. And so, um, and these data are the stamped handled data coming down off the spike and the Megiddo data set coming up to the this, this second spike. So we're very confident that there are in fact two spikes. Um, and uh, this purple curve is uh, a newer model than the first one I showed you that just went straight across. This one's 2014. There's another couple that have come out since then. I didn't want to show you all the models. There are, there's some agreement amongst the different models. They're getting better. They still don't capture this extreme behavior, but uh, they're, it's getting better. They're, as they gain more confidence in, in our results, then these, uh, th these data, the models are based on global data sets. So, um, one, uh, of, although they produce regional curves, they're, they're not uh, regional models. So they're overly smooth. Um, so, uh, then we, we spread out. I promised you that we were going to go to Hawaii, so we'll get there eventually. Um, in the meantime, uh, Ron Shar and I went off to Georgia. Um, and went to the Caucasus um, there and got some data. And uh, I have a, a postdoc from uh, China, from the Beijing lab, who's been working on. I, I went to China in the uh, mid 2000s and gave a, a talk about this work. And a student in the audience came up to me and said, That's what I want to do. And so she came to my lab for a year while she was a graduate student, and now she's a postdoc in my laboratory. And uh, she's been working on the Chinese data, and I'll show you some of those. It was inspired by this stuff that Hagai started, and, uh, and it continues um, in East Asia. And then uh, the promised goal of the tropical island of Hawaii, which Hagai and I went and sampled. Um, uh, a couple years before he passed away. So this is our Georgian study. We went to Georgia and we met this delightful archaeologist, um, Bachtan Michele, who um, allowed us to take samples of his nicest pottery. I, um, I love this guy, you know? <laughs> He let us at his collection, and he said, this is dated like that, and this is dated like that, and it was just marvelous collaboration. Ron Shar produced this beautiful paper. Um, I'll start here. This is obviously Levant, Greece, Bulgaria. I mentioned earlier that did not have the spike. Um, this is the Caucasus, which is the Georgian data set, and then these are data the literature from Turkmenistan. So starting with where we were, which is in the Levant, um, this is this curve that I just showed you. Uh, the red data are our black data, and the green are the Syrian data. So you know all about that with the two spikes. <laughs> all kind of nestled around 1,000 BCE, one's 1,000, one's 700, but never mind. There's not much going on at about 500 BCE. You can see that the field is not near spike values, and this is the spike. So let's go to the older data sets, Greece. This is Greece. Um, this is the, everywhere you can see there's this orange band is our pair of spikes. That's the interval that has the two spikes in Ron's coloring scheme. Um, and here's Greece. And you can see here, this is the spike. Here's Greece. It's present day field value is not anywhere close to twice as strong. Greece isn't that far away. So this is, uh, this is the cause of some of our puzzlement. Um, because you would think that Greece would have a similar record to the Levant in terms of the field. It's not that far away. And yet you can see there's no hint of a spike there in Greece. There is, there are high values, but they're more like 500 uh, years ago, uh, BCE, 
um, and a 9,000. So is this a chronology problem, or is the field really spatially that very old? Um, so you go to Bulgaria, same, same problem. No spike, gorgeous data. Um, there's this hint of very high values, about 500 BCE, not 1,000 BCE, this green secondary uh, high field value. Um, so Bulgaria isn't that far away. Um, and so is this a chronology problem, or is it regionally that variable? And then we go to the new data in Georgia, the Caucasus, and bless.com here. At 1,000 uh, ECB, you see very, if you take into account the uncertainties in this measurement, it's definitely spike values at the same time as our spikes in, uh, in Georgia. So hooray for Georgia, we've got high field values and this very low, these low values, um, about 1,500 BCB, which you also get here, not quite as low, but even lower here than here. And so there's differences between the Levant and the Caucasus, um, but you can see that, yeah, they, they, they got a spike there. Um, and in Turkmenistan, um, you know, it's not quite a spike, but this 500 BCE spike seems to be there. And, um, and uh, so these are the best data. These need to be redone um, with, uh, with Ron Shar's approach. And you going there, Ron? <laughs> um, and this, these are the Chinese data. Now here, um, this is uh, in a paper that uh, will come out in Frontiers of Earth Science pretty soon, uh, summarizing our work in China. And uh, this is the most recent of the many um, models, the brown, the brown and the blue are the models. Um, and here we have no spike at 1000 BCE, nothing. Uh, but this hint of very high values, these open circles were done in the early 80s and they are not by any means uh, modern, up to modern code of data. But Shukwe uh, Tsai um, is working on reproducing these we got a whole of the same samples that these were run on, and these high values seem to actually be true. So there may have been a spike, but it's nowhere near a thousand BCP. It's probably more like this 500 or even younger um, record. And um, and so these the solid symbols are her new data, and she found not only no spike, but a very low field value. This is 20 zeta avenue squared, which is uh, extremely low. It's been reproduced in several different um, pots of uh, several different areas around in China. And so now we have, uh, so you can see where I'm going with this, and that is um, that the spike is not global, it's a regional feature, the field um, uh, is very variable. Uh, so I promised you Hawaii. Guy and I and my husband and a guy's and girlfriend uh, went to, um, what was her name? Uh, anyway, we went to Hawaii and we sampled all of the lava flows that had been dated with radiocarbon. Because lava flows, they run out over a forest and then you have a pile of organic material under the lava flow, you can date it. It's not as good as slag where the forest may be old, um, but uh, there's a guy named Trusdell in Hawaii who, who does this for a living, and he came up with all these lava flows, which we went and we sampled. I show you this mess of the data. This reminds you of the state that things were in in, uh, in the Levant when it started. The red dots are hours, um, but, and by hours I mean uh, uh, my student Jeff Cromwell and Hagai. Uh, sampled about half of these, um, and uh, it just came out. And I think this might be, oh, it's certainly Haggai's last paper, it's my last paper. <laughs> it just came out a few weeks, a few months ago. Oops. And um, what did I do? Wait. Well, I was almost done. <laughs> I didn't promise. Okay. 
Um, and so I was almost done. Um, the, uh, um, the point of that was that there is no spike, even though um, Carlo Lage's lab had published data uh, from some lava flows that had very high field values, which is why we went there, about 1,000 BCP. But these are not reproduced by even themselves. Um, so these uh, very high values at the time of the Levantine spike um, were redone uh, using a different technique, and they were not able to reproduce these high values. We do not reproduce these high values. Our data, interestingly, drive right through um, two distinct data sets. One is these blue and teal values, which are, are done um, uh, using a tech, uh, very, uh, the original Tellier Tellier technique um, and, um, in one lab. And these other brown and uh, yellow values are done using not uh, total field um, measurements. They're done um, using a, a completely different technique that is not a, a technique like I described. Um, and they are distinctly lower than our values, whereas the uh, French data from Carla Lage's lab are distinctly higher than our data. Our data drive between these two distinct data sets. We believe that these are correct because for the historical fields, we reproduce the value from the uh, IGRF exactly, you know, within a microtesla using the same technique. So we've um, walked out uh, from a calibrated, uh, verified technique out into the beyond. Um, and, um, uh, and so the conclusion from this is that the field is highly variable, but that there's no spike in Hawaii. Uh, 3,000 years ago. So, our conclusions now are that the high fields are real, um, but they're not globally synchronous. The field can change very fast, at least locally, and very serious people are just going to have to get over themselves. <laughs> and um, I'm going to, we're standing our ground. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah. So maybe if you go higher, it will yeah. be around 
Zero. Yes, but people in Norway were not fire and pottery at that time. I think it's the problem. So, and there's no active uh, volcanoes in Sweden or Norway. Um, and so we need to turn to the late sediment records. Um, if you need those no, ones. Okay. Iceland. Um, yeah. The, but uh, they were in. Yeah, well, Iceland would be really fun. It would be cool. It is very cold. Uh, it would be uh, lovely, and I I don't think there's a lot of archaeomagnetic data from Iceland, although they were there at the time. Um, and and um, actually, three thousand years ago, we were looking more towards zero, more to look at around two thousand years ago, so there might be possibly also. Yeah, and you would think that uh, perhaps also in North America, but there's, uh, I have a student now working in uh, southwestern U.S., and we think that we can get back 7,000 years, or even 10,000 years. It hasn't been done. There's no, and this is no data. So um, this is a work in progress, and um, it, what we need, I laid it out, we need stuff that archaeologists will let us have that has a record in this field and that can be dated. And we'll, we'll be happy to do work on anything that meets those criteria. Um, okay. Thank you very much.